Well, we've said before that businessmen are aiming to maximize profit, but we haven't really gotten into, this, into the question of not so much what profit is, but what explains it, and therefore what justifies it. Where does profit come from? Why is there profit? What are the economic functions that it performs, etc.? Of course, profit is defined as total revenue minus total cost, and then if, then if we're interested in the ratio, it's that over like uh, total investment or total investment plus long-run debt. We'll get into more of that as we go along. The first thing to be done about profit is to separate profits into two very different kinds of returns, both of which are amalgamated into the accounting concept of profit. In other words, what is profit on the, sta- on the books of a firm uh, really includes two very different kinds of ro- returns, two very different kinds of reasons. Basically, they're, they're separable, separable into long-run profit and short-run profit. Long-run profit does not mean it only appears in the long run. It means that this is long-run profit is sort of an underlying return which capital investment receives as a sort of a continuing vector in a, in a day-to-day situation. So that's long-run profit, which, as we'll see, tends to be uniform throughout the system. That is not uniform, but tends to a uniformity. It's an important distinction. And a second category is short-run profit, which comes from completely different reasons and could well be, and often is, short-run losses. So we have what uh, is called the profit and loss system in the economy much more accurately than the so-called profit system. Because, of course, there are many firms that do make losses. I think, for example, of heroic entrepreneurs <clears throat> happen to be my uncles, who were pharmacy store capitalist entrepreneurs back in the 30s, and they had a chain of, I think, two or three drugstores at the height of their entrepreneurial career, quickly went bankrupt. Not just because of the Depression, because there are many other pharmacy stores that did not go bankrupt. But anyway, they went bankrupt, revealing themselves to themselves and to the world at large, or those who are interested, as lousy entrepreneurs, and they, after which they entered the ranks of the proletariat, in quotes, in other words, became wage earners. So entrepreneurs often do suffer losses. This can easily be seen when, when one form of entrepreneurship is quite obvious, namely uh, purchase of stocks and commodities, where, again, some people are good entrepreneurs and some people are bad ones, and we'll see in a minute what, the, what accounts for this. The short-run profit, the whole realm of short-run profit and loss, was unknown to 19th century economics. There are many things... When I say that, I mean all 19th century economists, both the Ricardo and Marx and also the Austrians, my particular favorites, they did not analyze, they did not explore the realm of short-run profit and short-run losses. Their eyes were fixed largely on, the long run, on long-run considerations, on so-called equilibrium situations. By equilibrium, again, I don't mean day-to-day equilibrium, but long-run equilibrium, so-called evenly rotating economy or final equilibrium. And so they're interested... Having their eyes on a longer or larger picture, they tended to ignore short-run considerations. They figured that will all wash out in the long run. But of course, the short run doesn't wash out because there's always a series of short runs, as we'll see as we go along. The short run is always with us and is always dominant. But the 19th century economics left this out of the picture and therefore left a a very uh, essential part of the explanation of profits uh, out of their analysis. Uh, It was Frank Knight who the founder of the old, what we can call the older Chicago School, the economist at the University of Chicago, who wrote a famous and brilliant PhD thesis, it was one of the sort of the top two or three PhD theses in the history of economic thought, Risk, Uncertainty, and Profit, which came out in 1921, where uh, Knight single-handedly brought the analysis of short-run profits into the picture and, and came up with a correct solution. He also messed up completely the theory of competition. That's another, that we get to in another time. <laughs> In the, in the theory of profits, however, uh, Knight came up with the, the definitive formulation that he didn't deal with long-run profits at all. Uh, he dealt really with, uh, he dealt with unsatisfactorily, but really not much at all. He dealt with a short-run, in, in quote, situation. And what he said was that profits, in the short-run sense, arise from uncertainty. The fact that the world was uncertain. See, the problem is that most economists in the past tended to think of the world as more or less certain. In other words, you look at the situation and say, well, we more or less know what the future is going to hold and as far as demand goes and costs and, and so forth. 
which of course leaves out an essential part of the picture, which is that the world is uncertain, that supplies and demands, resources, values of consumers, technology, all these things are constantly changing in an unforecastable manner, and they're certainly not subject to precise forecasting, and therefore we live in a world of uncertainty, what's often called in the popular parlance risk-taking. And so as a result of this, some people can see the future, can foretell the future in their area better than others. Some people can forecast, for example, the stock market, again, getting back to that, better than other people, quite obviously, because some people will buy stocks and then they go up, and other people will buy stocks and then they go down. This is not, however, a scientific, again, which we'll return to, it's not a scientific, it's not an applied science of forecasting. If it were, it would be like forecasting the uh, comets and sort of thing. Instead, it's a high art, because it involves not only your knowledge, general knowledge, it also involves detailed insight into the market and what's going on, and your specific knowledge of concrete events, which often keep changing, so you have to sort of, it sort of also involves hunches, and involves a personal entrepreneurship or personal artistry, which some people have and some people don't. And what it involves, again, is seeing gaps in the market. In other words, what you have really, in the long run, touching on long run profits, in the long run, profits all tend to be the same. In other words, supposing the angel Gabriel came down to the earth, I want to return to the angel Gabriel later on as a convenient, <laughs> convenient hypothesis. <laughs> angel Gabriel comes to the earth and freezes everything. In other words, he declares a freeze much more expensive than the Nixon freeze of August 71. He freezes all value scales. Everybody from now on will have the same value scale. All resources are frozen, so that any copper that's taken out of the ground will sort of magically be restored. All technology is frozen. Given that, given the freezing of all consumer demands and consumer value scales, given the freezing of supply, and was, so that an old stonemason dies, he's magically replaced by a young stonemason, and so forth and so on. Given this kind of model, then, in a few years, what you'd have is the following situation. You would have, for example, uh, certain industries that say are making 30% profits, others are making suffering losses. This means that capitalists will enter the profitable industries and get out of the losing industries. They do that now, too, but the point is, when you freeze everything, you see the conclusion of all this. They'll flood into the superior, the profit-making industries. As they flood into the high-profit industries, production increases, supply curve shifts to the right, the price falls, Costs are bid up, wage rates, uh, raw materials, etc. in that industry, and you wind up eventually, in a couple of years, let's say, with a, a uniform profit rate. What the uniform profit rate is, what it comes from, we'll get to later on. Let's say it's 8%, just for the heck of it. So we'll get to this uniform 8% and stop. In the meantime, those, who are, those firms that are now in the are capitalists or investing in the, in the losing industry, say the, the hula hoop industry, now the hula hoops are more or less defunct, We'll get out of there, stop making losses, move into other profitable industries, and whatever hula hoop firms exist, if any do exist, will also be making 8%. It might be, there's still a couple of horse and buggy manufacturers. Not, they're not very big. They make, say, horse and buggies for Central Park horse and buggy market. Presumably they're making the usual uniform rate of profit. So you wind up then, freezing, if you freeze everything, if you have this magic permanent freeze, you wind up with a a uniform profit rate throughout the whole system. Every firm, every industry is making this, this long-run normal rate of profit. And I say we'll get to later what determines the long-run normal rate of profit, why it exists in the first place, etc., etc. Right now we're focusing on the fact that short-run profits tend to disappear given a freeze, in other words, given certainty. If you know that there's a freeze, if you know that the freeze will persist forever, then you, you have certainty about the future will lie. Uh, you, have, you know with certainty what future consumer demands will be, what future costs will be, etc. And then you make your changes and you wind up after a six months, two years, whatever the, the time period. After this time period, you wind up with an evenly rotating economy where everybody's making, every firm is making its 8% or 6% or whatever the uniform rate is. In other words, short-run profits and short-run losses are wiped out. Now, obviously, the reason we have persisting short-run profits and losses, and why they keep changing all the time, fluctuating, appearing, popping up here and there, is because we don't have certainty, we have uncertainty, we have changes all the time, and all of these factors, changes in consumer values, changes in resources, changes in technology, etc. So what the, the function then, the profit maker, is engaged in a forecasting function, well, it's forecasting plus investment, I mean forecasting with a, with a bite, so to speak, it's not just forecasting as an abstract sociologist, is forecasting with his, with his pocketbook. 
He's investing money, and, he's, and by doing this, he's forecasting what, where he thinks he'll make a profit and not make a loss. This is not determined in advance. There's no guarantee that he's not going to make losses. There's no guarantee he'll make pro high profits. It all depends on his superior forecasting, in other words, forecasting better than his competitors. Uh, just as in the stock market, where it's clear this is what happens, the superior forecasters make heavy profits, the mediocre forecasters sort of peg along, break even, the lousy forecasters go out of business eventually, and make severe losses. So what you have then is the entrepreneur, in quotes, in other words, this, the capitalist as entrepreneur, as undertaker, so to speak, as risk taker, as uncertainty bearer, gains profits from superior forecasting. Superior forecasting for what? Superior forecasting and the best ways of meeting the most urgent consumer demand. In other words, the superior forecaster, he looks at the market and he sees, aha, there's not enough, whatever it is, tungsten production, let's say. If I go into the tungsten business and, I, and open up a new tungsten mine or produce more tungsten or whatever, I'll be able to make high profits because they're not making enough now to satisfy consumer demands. He might think of a better way of producing tungsten. A new, he might invent a new uh, process or and his brother-in-law might have been a new process, he finances the brother-in-law, or whatever. Again, he sees better than the other people, better than his competitors, where there are gaps in the market, where there are profit opportunities to be made, and then nips in to fill them. By filling these profit opportunities, he is increasing consumer welfare, because what he's doing is he's, he's filling these gaps. In other words, he's kind of zipping in there to take advantage of these uh, high profit opportunities, thereby directing production into those areas where the consumers are most urgently demand further resources, further production. So in other words, higher profits are an indicator of his superior, not only forecasting ability, but a superior ability in satisfying consumer, urgent consumer needs as quickly as, as, as efficiently as possible. Low profits or losses are an indicator of having wasted resources, being a lousy forecaster, uh, invest in, in uh, areas where consumers did not, either do not want the product too much, or there's a low demand for it, or invest in an inefficient manner. Well, for example, well, this, this only, of course, the government can do, because the government has no compunction as not to suffer losses, because the taxpayer picks up the tab, is forced to pick up the tab. There's a famous British groundnut scheme in West Africa about 20 years ago or so, when the British government invested or caused to invest an enormous acreage of peanuts, known in England as ground nuts. Some joker had the idea that the West African soil, or whatever, is suitable for peanuts. It was an enormous investment, all of which went down the tube. Usually, private enter entrepreneurs don't do this because they have to be very cautious about you know, investing correctly, which governments don't. But in other words, there's all sorts losses are an embodiment of malinvestment. In other words, embodiment of the fact that the guy has wasted resources. So we have a very peculiar situation. And another thing I should say is that the, the high profit person, the firm that earns high profits, are pointing the way toward other firms to get into this industry. In other words, if let's say a firm invests in tungsten and is a big, has a high profit in there, he's sort of pointing the road and saying, look, here's an area with a big gap in, in the market, big gap in filling consumer demands, and this is a beacon light for other capitalists, other investors to nip in there and produce more tungsten. On the other hand, of course, the guy who loses money in peanuts as an indicator and a beacon light to other capitalists, stay out of peanuts. This is not the place to invest. So, therefore, the, the profit maker, the capitalist who earns these profits from superior forecasting, etc., is performing an enormous social service to the consumer, in addition to making profits on his own hook. And yet we have the peculiar situation in the current culture where the profit maker is bitterly attacked and the loss maker is slobbered over by, by writers and intellectuals, etc., so in other words, in the current energy crisis, uh, the oil companies are bitterly attacked for earning high profits. Instead of saying, hey, this is a great thing that, that you're earning high profits, it's an indication of having, of being in an area where consumers need more uh, stuff, and we hope that other people will join you in this great endeavor, producing more oil. Instead of that, we're attacking the oil companies for the fact that if they're making profits as a sign that somehow they're evil. On the other hand, we have other companies which are suffering losses chronically, say Lockheed or Penn Central, and the government and intellectuals feel compelled to rush to their defense to subsidize them, to keep them floating forever, and thereby, of course, subsidizing their constant waste of resources, waste of land, labor, and capital, which would be better used, let's say, in oil or some other profitable industry. So we have this peculiar situation where the people who make losses are weeped over and subsidized, whereas the people who make profits are calumniated and they're taxed and their profits taxed away or they're hobbled in all sorts of ways. Thus, of course, penalizing efficient 
services to the consumer, uh, the man has consumer needs, and subsidizing an inefficient and crummy uh, service the consumer needs. It doesn't make too much sense, except, of course, if you want to smash the system altogether. It's a beautiful way of, of doing it. Okay, so this is the uh, function of so-called short-run profit. As a marvelous, uh, nobody else has picked up on this particularly, but I think as a marvelous illustration of the function of the entrepreneur and what the entrepreneur does, in a great, uh, one of the great Somerset Moore movies that appeared about 25, 30 years ago, I forget whether it was trio or quartet, one of these short subject things. And one of them was Moore's great short story called The Verger. And it's a charming story about this fairly elderly fellow who was a verger, in other words, a deacon, a, no, a sexton, I guess, at the uh, St. Paul's Church, a small church in London. A new uh, pastor comes in and wants to be, you know, make the place efficient and rev it up. And he finds to his horror the sweet old verger, the uh, performing his duties with great diligence, etc. He finds out this guy can't read. He says, this is a terrible thing. You're illiterate. Says, well, you know, what a shame this is for the community to have a verger of this great church that can't read. So he tries to force him to learn how to read and write. And the guy says, yes, sir, I'll try to learn. But he can't do it. He can't read and write. He says, Sorry, sir, I'm too old. And so the, the pastor kicks him out, gives him a terminal leave, and he's walking in the streets, very disconsolate. And here he is in fire, and he's 55 years old, whatever he was. He's walking the streets, he feels the need for a cigarette. He's pacing, he's walking down the streets of the neighborhood, looking for a tobacconist shop, and can't find one. He's pacing the street. Where is it? Where's the tobacconist shop? Then he gets this idea. Hey, if I can't find a tobacconist shop, there are other consumers in this area that can't find it. I think I'll take my savings and open one up, which he does, and does very well. It makes the, uh, very, it's very profitable. Then he walks around other neighborhoods in London, looking for other areas where he can't find a cigarette, <laughs> opens up a tobacconist shop there, and it's pretty soon he's got this big chain of tobacco in his shops. He has a lot of money, which he's up till now tucked away in his mattress or something. So he finally, somebody tells him he should go to open up a bank account, let them invest for you, etc. So he goes to this bank, and he plops all his money on the desk, his enormous amount of money on the desk. And he says, I'd like to open a bank account, etc. So yes, yes, sir, of course. And the bank manager gives him the forms to fill out. And he says, well, just sign your name on this form. He says, sorry, you know, it makes an X. Why are you making an exit? Because like, you know, I can't read or write. The bank manager looks at him, astonished me. He says, my God, man, where would you be today if you, could, if you only knew how to read or write? And the Virgin says, I know where I'd be. I'd be the Virgin at St. Paul. And this not only shows the entrepreneurship as filling the gap of the market, it also shows that reading and writing, or, or a PhD, or whatever, is not necessarily a royal road to successful entrepreneurship. <laughs> <laughs> there are indeed lots of illiterate uh, millionaires still roaming around who do very well. Lebanese importers, that sort of thing, who do very well even though they can't read or write. <laughs> Again, this indicates that successful entrepreneurship is an art rather than a, some kind of an educative science which you can learn, go to school and learn. Okay, so I think we can see the profit and loss element in, in profits, that the short-run profits and short-run losses see the social function that they perform. What about long-run profits? Now, long-run profits, they were the things that were focused on in the 19th century. Long-run profit, for reasons which we will come to, can also be called a rate of interest, capital earning a rate of interest in the long run. Why is there such? First of all, would there be long-run profits? Some economists have denied this. Some economists claim that in the, final, in the evenly rotating economy, in this long-run equilibrium situation, profits and losses would both be zero. Obviously, losses would be zero because nobody's going to invest. They knew they're going to make losses. That's pretty clear. So if you had a world of certainty and you had this equilibrium situation, nobody would make losses. But the contention of many economists is they wouldn't, their profits would be zero also. I deny this, and also I think many other economists do too. There's another thing to be explained here. You can't just use a night for explanation of entrepreneurship and short-run profits and losses and uncertainty. There's also a, this other stratum of 6%, 8%, 4%, whatever the percentage happens to be, which will tend to exist even in a world of certainty, even when there is no risk-taking, even when you know what the demands and costs will be forever and the technology forever and ever. Now, the reason, of course, we're interested in this long-run equilibrium model, although most microeconomics is only interested in that, uh, the reason why I am interested in other so-called Austrian economists are interested in this equilibrium model is as a method of separating long-run and short-run and trying to figure out the explanations of both of them, and also to see where the economy is tending. Because even if, if things are not frozen, of course they are not, we can say that, well, the economy is always tending in the direction of this equilibrium, even though it will never reach it. 
And it's not a great thing if it could reach it. It would be pretty miserable. But it will never reach it. It's a way of explaining direction and tendencies in the system. I like to think, the analogy I like to use is a dog chasing a mechanical rabbit. And the economy is a dog, long-run equilibrium, a uniform rate of profits throughout the system is a mechanical rabbit. And the mechanical rabbit is always changing direction in sort of unpredictable manner. And the economy tries to, the dog tries to follow it. It sort of, it leads you to be able to explain the tendencies in which the economy is going, but it'll never reach because the angel Gabriel does not come down and freeze values, resources, and technology. So if the angel Gabriel did come down and freeze it, then we would, after a couple of years, wind up in this kind of evenly rotating or long-run equilibrium system. Okay, so among the, one of the components then, we, we talked about short-run profits and short-run losses, forecasting and uncertainty. What about this other vector, this other long-run profit? Where does that come from? What's the explanation for it, et cetera? It's that profit, the long-run profit, for example, that Karl Marx was attacking as surplus value, as illegitimate, as extracted from workers' wages, and so forth. To be more specific, in the long run, labor earns wages, and wages are determined by the marginal productivity, marginal revenue products we've seen of, of the workers. Land earns rent, which is also marginal, determined by marginal revenue products. We, we can see how that happens. What about capital? Where does profits come in? Or where does this long-run profit or interest come in? We'll see a little later why it's called interest. Now, the easy answer for this, and the answer to the so-called productivity theory, probably invented by Nassau Sr., the great English 19th century classical economist, which is still in the textbooks, by the way, uh, the easy answer goes as follows. And it comes from this triad, which is really a legitimate triad, of land, land labor, and capital. Three kinds of the three kinds of factors of production. Labor earns wages in accordance with the marginal productivity. Land earns rent in accordance with its marginal productivity. And capital, in quotes, in other words, machines, equipment, buildings, all, this, all these man-made factors of production, earn profits, earn rate of interest because of its productivity. And the usually, you know, the, this sort of productivity explanation is, well, after all, since capital machines are very productive, they're very important in production, therefore, machines have to earn something too, so therefore, that machines get this rate of interest, the rate, rate of profit. And you'll see, for example, in, in most textbooks, this sort of diagram. The economists will start with a marginal rate of product productivity theory, wind up with this sort of thing, usually in the labor market. Say, okay, in the y-axis, there's wage rates. In the x-axis, there's purchase of, of labor, purchase of the factor, hiring. And the demand for, and there's a supply curve and demand curve, the demand for the man curve for labor is, is equal to the marginal revenue product, marginal productivity. Then the next chapter, or the next diagram, the author says, okay, in the same way, capital earns interest. Instead of having wage rates on the y-axis, you have interest. Suddenly it pops up. And then you have capital hired or purchased. And then you have the demand curve for capital or demand curve for machines or whatever, which is supposedly equal to the marginal revenue product, which then determines the interest rate. There's lots of problems with this. In the first place, there's a tremendous equivocation of the word capital. There's two different uses of the word capital. There's capital as a funds available for investment, and there's capital goods. There's machines, tools, buildings, trucks, etc., etc. The problem with this is, it looks pretty easy. Look, you sort of, you, the economist then wraps the whole thing up, and that explains profits, and you go on to something else. The problem here is that interest has nothing to do with wage rates. It's not analogous at all. The analogous thing for capital is the price of the machine or the price of a building or whatever. So where does interest come in? Or in other words, the marginal, the machine also earns its marginal revenue product. It gives it a price. If the marginal revenue product of a machine is, let's say, $10,000 a year, let's assume for a while, for various, to simplify matters, that nobody buys a machine. I'll get back to buying machines later. Let's assume everybody rents the machine. There's machine producers, the capitalists who produce, and other people who rent the machine out. Assume it's, they're all rented. And then the marginal revenue productivity, let's say, is $10,000 a year. The question then is, why is it not that the capitalist who rents the machine, why, why doesn't he have to pay $10,000 for it? In other words, this should be $10,000 here on the intersection point. We should wind up with the price of the machine being $10,000. In fact, it isn't. The point is, in fact, it's lower than $10,000. The price of the machine is, let's say, $9,000 which means that the guy who rents the machine, the, the capitalist who rents the machine from the producer, earns a 10%, let's say, interest rate. It's usually less than that. Let's say it's 10%, like it's simple. Something like 10%. The question then to, to be discovered, you see, in other words, the marginal productivity theory doesn't explain 
interest, uh, the existence of interest or long-run profits at all. What it explains is the existence of a price for a machine, that you have to pay a certain amount. So where does interest come in? It doesn't, the answer is it doesn't come in yet. So the productivity theory has, there's not an explanation at all of the interest rate. So then the thing to be explained is why is there, a, why is the, why is not the price bid up to 10,000? Why is it only, say, 9,000, 9,100? And then the capitalist then will earn 10%. In the same way, wages and rents, land rents are also discounted in a very similar way. So that we wind up with, with wages and r- land rents all discounted by an interest rate. Right, let's say 10%. It could be 6%. It all depends on what the interest rate happens to be. So then the question is, how come permeating the system, we have a, an interest return for capitalists, totally apart from forecasting, from risk-taking, and all the rest of it. Why is it wages and uh, land rents and capital and machinery are not bid up to their full margin revenue product? Put it another way, Karl Marx pointed out that the laborer had to pay a surplus, had to pay a, a, this, this profit rate. The capitalists. One of the answers to this is, well, yes, that's true, but on the other hand, also land has to pay a profit rate, and machines have to pay it. You wind up with this discount going all the way across the board. Then the question is, why are they cheerfully willing to pay it? Because they obviously are. Why is it that the market winds up, and the free market winds up with a sort of payment being made? Because call it exploitation, etc., doesn't really answer the question, obviously. And also we find out that this, that this productivity theory doesn't answer it either. What we had is that the answers to the Marxian or the other attacks on profit were not satisfactory throughout the 19th century. The answer finally came with one of the greatest economists history of economic thought, Eugen von Bumbawerk and his great work Capital and Interest, which came in as the combination of the older Austrian school in the middle 1880s. It was only Bumbawerk that really sort of copper riveted the explanation. It came up with the, with the answer to this whole puzzling question of where long-run profits come from, or interest rates come from. One way of introducing this Bombardierian solution is that you rent out a machine and you produce it over a year and you, and you get you earn this 10 percent or 6 percent or whatever. The key thing wrapped up in this whole thing is time. In other words, time is a key element in the earning of interest. Or to put it another way, part of the Marxian critique, he said, "Well, it's true that capital goods are productive; uh, they're very important. However, capital goods are themselves produced. They don't drop from the sky. They're themselves produced by land, labor, and capital." If you push the whole thing back, logically, capital drops out, and you're left with only labor and land. And what Marx said is that, uh, therefore, labor should get the entire income, entire product. Of course, if you add, since you ignore land, what you have to do, first of all, is add land into the picture, and say labor and land should get the whole product. And then you have to say, well, after all, product takes a long time, so the time in some way enters in. You wind up, with, instead of saying, as Marx said, the capital goods are frozen labor, or embodiment, frozen embodiments of labor, which you can modify that and say, first place, okay, first place, we have to include in labor management and entrepreneurship, you know, decision making, entrepreneurship in the, in the short run, uncertainty. So in other words, the president of General Motors would also be a laborer. And second of all, aside from that, with land, it's also frozen land and it's also frozen time. And then we'll see that the key to the long run rate of Profit is precisely this whole time consideration, or so-called time preference. Before I get into more into that, I want to put on the board a great diagram which is, has dropped out of current economics, the so-called structure of production concept, which von Bawerk and the Austrian school introduced to the world. Orthodox economics today, capitalism is treated as one big blob, a homogeneous lump. And so there's all sorts of measurement supposed measurements of capital output ratios and so forth and so on, and the statements that all you need to increase production is more capital, which leads to things, for example, like the government investing, underdeveloped countries say government will invest in a, in a steel mill when they haven't got the roads to take the steel off, they haven't got any of the other stuff, they just got the steel mill. We start with consumption on the lowest level. Consumers, let's say, spend $100 billion during a year on retail stores. So you have $100 billion going from the consumer to the first stage of production, which is the retail industry. Designate this by a bar. $100 billion is the length of the, the bottom. So money is going up this bar. In other words, money is going from the consumers to the retailers, and goods of all sorts are going down from the retailers to the consumer. That's the first bar. Okay, that's, so the retailers now have $100 billion in their pockets, and what are they going to do with it? Well, most of it, of course, goes to the wholesalers to buy the inventory, etc. But a certain amount gets siphoned off to the uh, people in the retail industry. Let's say 10 billion. So 10 billion 
goes off to to function as income. In other words, uh, to wages, land, rent, interest, and profits. So we have 100 then going to the, to the retail industry. 10 billion got to get siphoned off, and the other 90 billion goes to the wholesalers. Now we have another bar, the wholesale bar, which is, however, shorter because 10 billion dollars have already been siphoned off. The same thing that happens to the wholesaler. Here's a retailer, wholesale, and wholesalers siphon off another 10 billion, let's say, and 80 billion goes to the jobbers to get their inventory. And once again, we have 10 billion going to wages, land, rent, interest, and profits in the wholesale industries. And then we go to the jobbers. The 80 billion goes to say 90 billion, then 80 billion. And we keep on going. We got the manufacturing and the mining and farming. And as we keep on going, in each stage of production, money gets hived off until finally, logically, you wind up with all the money going to personal income. This is the structure of production. This is this ladder kind of effect. Well, a lot of things happen here. First place, the 100 billion gets hived off. They so have 100 billion in personal income. Then the consumers, the wage earners, the landowners, the capitalists, etc., assets, take the 100 billion and they might save and invest it. But let's say for a minute that they just spend it again. Then you have the so-called circular flow then. And the dollars get turned over as they go on up a ladder. They have the structure of production. As the capitalist system advances, as more and more capital gets invested, more and more the structure becomes higher and higher. And here we have this enormous structure of capital which keeps increasing. And we'll see when we get to business cycle theory how this can be used very, very readily to explain business cycles, what happens, why the business cycle occurs, and so forth. The point is, all this money gets hive off in income, and this of course endorses the Marxian point to the extent, yes it's true, each stage of the way is produced by other stages, and you wind up with all the income, all the hundred billion, gets exhausted by at each step of the way, so that there's no, ex no net profit accruing to capital machine producers, per se. In other words, it all gets washed off in the labor, land, rent. So the interest in profits can't be explained by the, it's still unexplainable on this, on this diagram. Again, you can't explain interest in profits by the purely productivity kind of explanation. So what is the explanation? Well, as I said, it's time explanation. Each stage of the game takes time. How does time enter into the picture? Well, it goes like this. The function of the capitalist, again, this is not talking about the manager or the entrepreneur, we're talking about the pure capital function, the pure supplying of capital. The function of the capitalist is this. He saves up money from previous profits or previous income or whatever. Capitalist saves up money and pays money out to existing producers existing workers and landowners while they're producing. In other words, let's assume for a minute there are no capitalists. And it's certainly, logically, there's no reason on the free market why you can't have a world of, all, of producers co-ops, of workers and landowners co-ops, or pure workers co-ops, or whatever, which have no capital function at all. There's no capitalists. They're just, everybody gets together and decides they're going to produce an automobile or whatever. Supposing they do, why has this not flourished in the free market? Because it's certainly in the free market, there are no laws repressing this kind of producer's co-op. Producer's co-op has always been abysmal failures. They've never succeeded worth a darn. Major reason is very simple. The workers say they're out to build tungsten or they're out to build automobiles or produce automobiles or whatever. It'll take them quite a while to do it. In other words, the workers all get together and they work on this thing. They get in the landowners, etc., and they get the raw material, let's say. Take them, let's say, three years, five years, or whatever, to produce an automobile. Five years, they ain't getting paid. They're hoping that they'll be able to sell the automobiles when they get on the market. Now, aside from the risk function, which we'll get to, we'll get back to in a minute, everybody understands the risk function, I think, pretty well. There's a pure time problem here. It's our waiting. In other words, the sheer problem of having to wait five years without getting paid until the money comes rolling in. As far as I'm concerned, I would not be able to last more than a couple of weeks <laughs> without payment. And I think for most people, this is true also. So what function of the capitalist performs here, the very, very vital function for the producers, for the workers and landowners, it gives them money now while they're working every week or every month so they don't have to wait five years until the automobile is produced. Who waits? The capitalist waits. In other words, the capitalist takes on the waiting function. And then at the end of the six months or the five years, whatever the period of production happens to be for that particular product, the capitalist sells the car and gets the, and gets the revenue and gets, what does he get for this? How is he rewarded for this? He's rewarded by the interest rate. And he's rewarded by the rate of 
time proper. So he is performing an extremely important and vital function, a function which everybody should love. They really thought about it. It enables them to get money now instead of having to wait for five years until the money pours in. For this service, they pay the capitalists a discount. You have to modify, and this again you'll not find in the textbooks, unfortunately. You have to modify the marginal productivity theory to say that labor and land and all the other products get not their marginal revenue product, but their marginal revenue product discounted by the rate of interest. So the rate of interest is a or the rate of long run profit is a willing exchange. See, since we realize in contrast to the Marxist on the free market Exchanges are voluntary, so we have to be some sort of function that this capitalist profit is, is reaping for this discount they're getting. And the function is precisely handing out money now instead of having, instead of the producers having to wait for it. To put it another way, this is a time preference exchange or a time market, very, very similar. As a matter of fact, economically, analytically identical to the, to the credit debt exchange. So what's happening when a capitalist hires workers, for example? Capitalists have saved up money previously. Capitalist is paying out money now. He's paying out a present good. In other words, money is a present good. Money is something which can be used at any time in the present. Any time the person wants to, you can spend it. So this is a so-called present good. Workers and landowners, etc., producers in general, are getting the money now, and in exchange for this, the capitalist is receiving future good. In other words, he's expecting, uh, he's receiving a future income from the car or whatever. So in other words, he is changing a present good for a future good. And here we get to the primordial universal fact of time preference. Again, Bombardier was the first one to really discover and analyze. Time preference meaning, if you remember the old motto that a bird in the hand is worth two in the bush. What the time preference motto says, a bird in the hand is worth more than one bird in the bush. Forget about two in the bush. The point is that a present good is worth more than the expectation of a future good. Now, different people and different groups and different societies have different rates of time preference. Some people have very high time preference. For example, myself, just before the next paycheck arrives, a very high rate of time preference. I'm willing to, to borrow at high rates <laughs> for the three days or whatever it is as, as my money runs out, as my bad management takes over. That's a high rate of time preference. And then there are low rates of time preference, the people who have great foresight and plan ahead for the future and so forth and so on. So there are all sorts of different rates of time preference, just as with other marginal utilities. There are all sorts of value scales in society. There are all sorts of value scales for hula hoops and for donuts and whatever. In a similar way, there are all sorts of value scales and relative marginal utilities for time. These time preferences get all intermixed and, and, and in the time market, which spreads throughout the whole system, which results in one single or tendency toward one single rate of time preference which is the resultant of all these individual time preferences. Just as the price of hula hoops on the market is the resultant of all of the margin utility value scales for hula hoops. So if everybody has a low rate of time preference, you'll have a low rate of interest, a low rate of discount. If everybody has a very high rate of time preference, you'll have a very high rate of discount. This is analytically the same thing as a credit transaction. In a credit transaction, if I borrow $100 from my friendly local pawnbroker or whatever, the creditor pays out present money, say $100 as a present good, to the debtor. He's getting from the debtor, say from me, an IOU, a claim on a, some future good, in other words, money in the future, say a year from now. And instead of paying $100 back, I'm going to pay more than that. I'm going to pay, let's say, $108, 8% rate of interest. Why am I willing to pay the 108 and why is he charged 8% and why am I willing to pay it for the same reason, because both of us and the society in general place this, this premium on time. So that in this situation, it's worth more to me to borrow now. It's worth say, more than the 8%. So I will borrow. He has lower time preference than I've got, in other words, within this 8% framework. So he lends money to me. The point then is, for both of us and society then is, in general, values present goods more than future goods. Value is $100 now, much more than the present value of $100 a year from now, and therefore, and the charge, the, the rate will be set accordingly in the market. Now, sometimes the rate will be lower if, if everybody's thriftier or more foresighted, the rate might shift to 4%, 4 or 4% or whatever. Other times it might rise to 20%. So whatever the rate is, it's determined by the social, the time preferences of all the individuals in the society. 
One, one example that Mises, Louis von Mises used to give, is as the year 1000 approached, most Christians, their interpretation of the Bible was, the year 1000, Jesus would return to earth and the whole world will come to an end and we have the kingdom of heaven on earth. This is a millennialist view. And so as you get to 998 AD, 999 AD, when most people expected the world would come to an end in the year 1000, nobody is very anxious to lend money for a three year period after that, you know, to be returned in 1000 CE AD. <laughs> Because it won't be of much use. As a result, the interest rates began to go up. If people really expect the world to come to the end, the interest rate will start going up to infinity if they really expected that. So as you get very close to the point of day of Armageddon, the interest rates would zoom up to 10,000% a day or whatever it would be. <laughs> this would be a time preference rate. The function of the capitalist is very similar to the function of the creditor. The capitalist is supplying present goods just as the creditor is supplying present goods. And instead of receiving a, a fixed debt, in return, he's getting another kind of a future good. He's getting the car when it's going to come off the assembly line and he'll be able to sell it. He's getting the ownership of the car when it eventually emerges. So in both cases, the economic function is the same. What the capitalist is doing then, in the real world, he's performing two functions. One, he's performing the short-run function of hopefully successful entrepreneurship and forecasting and forecasting changing future trends and uh, meeting consumer demands in the future performing his entrepreneurial uncertainty function, and two, he's performing this 8% function, he's performing this time function of supplying present goods and taking on the burden of waiting for the, the future. For this, as I say, the, the worker is happy to give him the 8%. Uh, at least they might think they're not, they're listening to too many Marxists. The point is, in action, they are happy to do it, otherwise they wouldn't be doing it. Otherwise, they'd be forming workers' co-ops. So the two reasons we can say why workers' co-ops have failed, produce, one, because most workers don't have the money to start in, to pay themselves out. They want to wait for five years before they get paid. And two, because they don't want to take on the risks of losing all their money. They want to take on the uncertainty risks, both of which the capitalist assumes, both the uncertainty bearing and the waiting burden. Uh, so that we have a selective sort of process where the uh, capitalist entrepreneurs tend to be those who are most able to do both of these things, wait and forecast the future. So now we see a vision, so to speak, of the of the economic system looming up, where the consumer goods prices are determined by values of consumers, consumers' value scales by the margin utility and the law of diminishing margin utility. Producers' goods prices, in other words, wages, land rents, machines, machines, etc., are determined by the marginal revenue product, the marginal productivity set by the marginal productivity, and going through this whole system, discounting all the marginal productivity. Whenever there's time involved, there's a rate of interest or a rate of time preference, where the capitalist earns the discount. So, I say, Bombardier was the one who cleared up this problem. There's another similar problem, in addition to the Marxian problem, which Hornswoggle and eventually lay low Catholic scholastic philosophers. So, Catholic scholastic philosophers, not only in the Middle Ages, but also much later than that, in the late in the 16th, 17th century, were extremely brilliant social analysts and also economists. And they analyzed, first of all, one of the reasons why this hasn't been discovered until about 20 years ago, but they all wrote in Latin, and you know how many people read Latin now. And nobody reads them, and nobody read them for a long, long time. And it turns out that in, in Book 12 of their Summa Theologica or something, here's a, a very sophisticated analysis of the market, and they understood much about the market. And as a matter of fact, they almost discovered marginal utility. They didn't quite do it, but they almost came up to that point. But there was one thing that they completely flubbed on, which later discredited them, and that was they couldn't understand, they could understand about risks, they could understand why people would be risk-bearing and get a profit. They could understand about making money in a, in a risky investment, they could understand about all sorts of stuff about profits, but they could never understand about time preference. They could never understand the legitimacy of, of charging interest rate on a pure consumer loan. Uh, so they call this usury. Their analysis was, well, Taking from Aristotle, which they were very good Aristotelians, they said, well, Aristotle says that money is, is a dead thing, you can't eat money, or whatever, you can't really, you can't dig the ground with it, etc. It's not moral, it's sinful to charge any interest whatsoever on a pure loan. And they call that usury. Now, we think of usury now as somebody charging 20, you know, 28% per day interest. But usury, the technical definition of usury is as any interest whatsoever, because this is the, the philosophical problem the scholastics had. And so the church, taking off from this, condemned usury for almost until about the 
middle of the 19th century or so. Now, there's many problems involved in this. It meant that if you say that all interest is illegal and immoral, everybody would have started evading it. Even very good Catholics started evading it. So they started discovering that the scholastic philosophers themselves would ratify all sorts of devious ways of getting around this prohibition. They had all sorts of things like forward market and foreign exchange, bills of exchange, and maneuver it in such a way that you'd be charging interest but not, not saying it, pretending it's only a foreign exchange market. And also the very sophisticated devices, the church itself, when it loaned money, charged interest. <laughs> it was therefore engaged in this sin of usury. So this whole usury thing discredited at least the economic analysis of the scholastics. Uh, it was partly responsible for the decay of scholastic philosophy in general. The problem was they never discovered time preference. So they didn't have Bombavik around to uh, come around several hundred years later and clear up the problem. The problem, in other words, being that, yes, you are performing a function by lending out money. You're, you're giving somebody money now in return for future money. In other words, you're, you're giving them a present good. You're satisfying their time preference, the desire to have money now instead of in the future. This is just as important as any other service. Therefore, there's nothing wrong with charging interest on it. However, as I say, they, hadn't, they didn't ever discover that. Another thing I should say here about wages and land rent, the theory of rent, which again was discovered by Frank Fetter, who's one of my favorite economists, Austrian school economist of Princeton and Cornell in the 20 years of the 20th century, who built on Bombavec time preference, to purify the time preference theory of Bombavec, kicked out the productivity stuff I've been talking about, uh, more clearly than Bombavec did, because Bombavec kind of fudge a little bit toward the end. There are also a very interesting theory of rent where it's saying, well, actually, after all, rent is not just land rent. What it really is, it's very similar to renting out. In other words, it's renting, it's the common sense view of rent, of renting a tuxedo or renting a house instead of buying it. So we have two different things here. Where rent then becomes a charge for a service per unit time, uh, rent per hour, rent per month, rent per year, etc. In English, classical economics, in the old days in England, very few people, the aristocratic families didn't sell land. They only rented it out. So you you think of land only in terms of rent. What really happens is that every good and service, every labor and wages, land and rent, machines and so forth and so on, every productive factor earns a product, productivity per unit time, and this is their, it's rent. In other words, if a machine is worth $10,000 a year, it's going to get $10,000 a year in rent minus the rate of interest, discounted by the rate of interest, let's say 9000 if it's a 10% rate. And so rents then permeate the economy, not just for land, but for everything. We can then look on wages as also a rent. A laborer sells his services per unit time. He doesn't sell his body, except under slavery. Absent, absenting slavery, then, you can only rent yourself out. You can't sell yourself. And so wages are also a rent. You don't have only really two forms in a world of certainty. There are only two forms of income, as rents and interest. In other words, Every productive factor earns a rent, whether it's labor or land or capital goods. And then finally, the capitalist earns a discount, which is the rate of time preference and rate of interest. And then, of course, in the world of uncertainty, we have profits and losses, short-run profits and short-run losses. So that rent then becomes a universal kind of productive income, in which everybody, in a sense, earns. And we can see this. One of the problems is that economists haven't really analyzed the economics of slavery. Slavery is a fascinating institution from an economic point of view, not that I want to restore it for that, for that reason, <laughs> because under slavery, for example, in the South, sometimes slaves were sold and sometimes they were rented out. So, in other words, the slave then became a slave master, treated the slave as any other capital, and so the slave was, was often rented out to other capitalists uh, seasonally or whatever. Okay, so we've explained consumer goods prices, we've explained profits, wages, rents, marginal productivity, interest, time preference, etc., and even and short-run profits. There's one thing left to go, really, in this explanation. We've explained the rental price of labor, or the rental price of the land, or the rental price of the machine, but not the price of the whole good. Where does that come from? Presumably, there's some sort of relationship. When a slave, if a slave could be rented out, for, say, for $1,000 a year, the sale price of the slave must have some relationship with marginal product, so it's $1,000 a year. Similarly, if a house can be rented out for 10000 a year, the total price of the house must have some relation to the annual rental price, as indeed, of course, it does. So the next thing, then, is the price of the whole good, which is also called, very confusingly, I must admit, the capital value of the good. The reason, of course, why this is confusing is we're already using capital in at least two other senses. 
we've been talking about capital as a capital good, as a produced factor of production, machinery, buildings, etc. But capital value applies not just to that, it applies to everything. It applies to land, it applies to people under slavery, it applies to anything which can be owned. What's the capital value of a house or a machine or whatever? Well, the first, the first approximation is it will be the sum of expected future return, or in our terminology, expected future rent. Let's say that you have a machine which you should think you can rent out for $10,000 a year, and it's a 10-year life. So in that case, uh, 10, 000, you expect a return now of $10,000 over 10 years, and a total return of $100,000. So therefore, you might think the capital value, if you're going to sell the machine, you'll be able to get on the market $100,000 because that's how much the guy will get in return. That's the first approximation. However, of course, it's wrong. The reason why it's wrong is because you have to discount the expected future returns by what? By the rate of interest. So you have the discounted sum. You have this machine. You're thinking about buying this machine. You know that after 10 years, it will give you $100,000. Let's say you know that. Your value that you place on the tenth year of $10,000 is a lot less than on today's $10,000. And the discount that you'll charge, that you'll consider or estimate it at, is the rate of interest, the going time preference rate or going rate of interest. Let's say it's 10% to make it simple. In that case, if you get, let's say you're getting the money in now, just to make it in the first year, your total sum that will be charged on the market, the market equilibrium price of the machine is a total sale value, It'll be $10,000 plus, not $10,000, but $10,000 discounted by, say, 10%, say $9,000. And then the second year's $10,000 will be discounted by that plus another 10%, approximately $8,100, 7300 etc. If you wind up, not with $100,000, but with something like $56,000 or whatever, if you can add it up. So the point is, the price of the whole good will be, the, let's say, the discounted sum of expected future returns or expected future rents. And then when you buy this machine, and then yourself rent it out, or yourself use it, it doesn't matter, you will be getting a 10%. You'll be getting this uniform rate of interest, instead of the other guy who has it now. Same way with a house. If you buy a house and rent it out for 20 years, the price won't be bid up to the 100000 or the 200000 or whatever. It'll be that minus the rate of interest. So when you buy the house at the lower price, you will get, you'll have a room for the 10% return per year, or whatever the interest return happens to be. This process, by the way, of summing up this kind of this kind of future returns into a present value is called capitalization. Capitalizing expected future returns into a present sum. That's pretty obvious if we didn't have capitalization. Land, for example, wouldn't be able to be sold at all. Because land is permanent. Assume the Fifth Avenue of 42nd Street will always be there because it's a fixed part of the earth. Sort of an atom bomb explosion or something will always be there. So we can expect that land is perpetual, or bring some sort of perpetual return. If we expect that land will bring you $10,000 return forever, let's say, without an interest rate discount, you'd never be able to sell it because the price would be infinite. So how can you sell something at an infinite price? Obviously, the point then is that you sell land because the expectation of getting $10,000 a year in 3000 AD is, it doesn't loom very large in your consciousness. You're discounting it by very heavily. It means almost nothing. You get down to a sort of asymptotic relationship where it's virtually zero, and this sum becomes the, the amount that you, you're willing to sell it for and the amount the other guy's willing to buy it for. So in equilibrium, the market price of the, the entire thing, whether it's a slave under slavery or a machine or a land or aggregations of these things, will tend to be the discounted sum of expected future rents or expected future returns. The formula for a perpetual resource the life of the thing is infinite, such as land. There's a simple formula for this which sort of illustrates the, the capital value C is equal to R, the annual rent or the annual rate of return, divided by the rate of interest. So if uh, the annual return is $1,000 a year and the rate of interest is 10%, capital value will be 10000 Now we see this happening all the time, by the way, in the stock market. The point is that the as returns increase, increased returns have to increase the capital value and vice versa. The capital value of anything is proportionate to the ret annual return, expected annual return, inversely proportionate to the rate of interest. As the rate of interest goes up, it tends to lower the general, the capital value of everything. And we'll see how this applies to the conservation and why copper miners will produce a certain amount now and wait for the next 10 years to produce the rest of it, etc. I think we have enough for this lecture.